Welcome to Suspicious Minds. With me again is Wade Durbin. And you are always Burl Tuttle. And I am pronouncing it right. It's Wade, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm to double check. Right, I, right. One you know, Okay, just Wade. Okay, yeah, that's right. Because sure. you know, there's not the accent or the E like I thought there right. was. Right. No right. cloud. Yeah. A, a lot of people assume it's Wade. Yeah. Oh, right. Because of the singer, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the shoes were real popular in the uh, 80s. 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s. I mean, probably the sun never, forever, probably. The, the sun never sets on Sade. Okay. So, she, but she, yes, of she, course, she, we're talking about Sade. Of course, she was named after uh, the Marquis de Sade. Very famous French poet, correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You, yeah, you are correct. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, once again, we have gone off the rails even this quickly into the show, but welcome yeah. to Suspicious Minds. And I'm going to say I'm pretty excited about this one. Yeah, this is going to be a fun one. Uh, yeah. This is episode 13 Lucky for those 13. keeping for those keeping score at home. Yep. We are going to be talking about the film debut of Elvis Presley, the 1956 film Love Me Tender. Yep, it's a real treat. One that I don't know about you, probably one of my least watched. I know I've seen it once before, probably, yes. but I don't think it's ever gone. I don't think I'd ever gone back to rewatch it. It is in the video store era, probably one that I never would have rented. I would have rented any other Elvis movie over Love Me Tender back in those days. Uh, Which one? What what would you do? Geez, you know, obviously my go to was probably a Viva Las Vegas. Yeah. Though I I think I owned that on VHS like pretty early in the game. So I wouldn't have had to rent it. But um, Charo, I would rent that every now and again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I guess also another Western, but it's not to play down how good and how important this movie is. Cause it really launched his film career, you know? It, yeah. Um, yeah. It was, um, the proof of concept. You can put this, uh, Elvis kid on the big screen and people will respond to it. Exactly. And on a giant marquee outside the theater when they opened yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. And I would say, Glimmers of some very good acting. Yeah. And there are a lot of ways that Love Me Tender is off model when it comes to your standard Elvis vehicle. Because yeah. it really isn't an Elvis vehicle. It was, yeah. the story goes, Elvis was signed to uh, MGM and did a screen test. Everybody agreed, like, you know, this kid needs to be in a movie. But they're having like the hardest time thinking of the right project to launch Elvis on the big screen. It's like they mm-hmm. just couldn't think of anything. So in the interim, wanting to uh, strike while the iron was hot, MGM loaned Elvis out to 20th Century Fox to make this film, which was going to be a Western originally titled The Reno Brothers. And it was just a minor role. And the whole idea was like, well, you know, we'll put him in this movie as a kind of a glorified supporting character just to see if it works. You know, right. like who knows, maybe it won't, but if it doesn't work, it's not necessarily going to sink the movie. Right. I mean, he doesn't show up till about 20 minutes in, give or take. Oh yeah. And a half, 19 yeah. minutes in. So it takes sure. a while for him to appear, but they start milking him for everything he's worth immediately. Right. So, um, it, it, it would have been hilarious if he was like the shark and jaws, like just hinted at throughout the entire film until right. like the last scene where, ah, uh, Elvis shows up. Uh, yeah, that also may have worked. You never know. Probably would have yeah, yeah. I think they would have had a lot of very disgruntled teenage kids, mostly sure. girls, screaming right. them on their money back if that was the case. That- because, yeah, I'd be willing to bet that this was not a film that would have been very high on the list of teenage girls to go see if Elvis had not been in it. And here's what I'm going to say. For as attractive a leading man as that Richard Egan is, that was in his um, demographic. Yeah, I mean, he's just, throughout this whole movie, Richard Egan is bringing that, like, grown-ass man energy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I would agree with that. But a lot of different places, he's, he's, and I, you know, and he's a hunk. Yeah. He's a pretty hunky dude, so. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, uh, before we get too far into this, uh, do you want to summarize what we see in Love Me Tender? What, What is this film about? It's loosely based on kind of true events. There was a Reno gang. There were some mm-hmm. Reno brothers 
Now they terrorized, I don't know, it was sort of like Midwest and Southern Indiana, Kentucky, that kind of area. They Mm -hmm. were train robbers post-Civil War, Mm -hmm. like that era. Right. So the 18... 65 through about 1870, I think, Mm -hmm. until a bunch of them were captured and then there was like a mass hanging of them. Right, right. So that's what actually happened. This is sort of a very toned down version of that. Mm -hmm. And it all takes place at the day the Civil War ended, or was it the day after? Well, the Union soldiers at the train station just got word that the war had ended. Right. So it's April 10th. Word is spreading that the war is over. And unbeknownst to these Confederate soldiers, they go and they rob the Union payroll train Mm -hmm. that they're rolling through. And they wind up massacring a few of the troops and killing the train station attendant. I guess Mm -hmm. that's what you call them, train station attendant. I don't know. Or uh, station manager. Sure. Why not? Or something. I don't know. Who cares? Yeah, Yeah, really. Who's splitting hairs? And I'm going to just real quick. Now, when this is all happening, you'd think they'd at least like throw something over the guy because it's, <laughs> right. you know, like it's, it's one of those parts of it. that's like, you know, somebody could walk into this building and there's just a dead guy in the middle of the floor. Well, they really only had a few minutes to prepare for the train to show up. And the idea was to like rob the payroll and get the hell out of there. Just not how it worked out. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, they did leave like a dead body. Just in plain open. sight. In plain sight. And I guess to to kind of bring this to, so the train's rolling in and they're just having time to like switch into the union soldiers clothes and like get their Mm -hmm. pants up and stuff. So the fact that they didn't cover up one of the station manager's body, I guess you can let it slide. It does sort of make sense, but still you think if you'd go into that room, you'd be like, well, we'll just throw some newspapers over them or like topple some boxes on them or something. Sure. Sure. Just to put a bottle of rum in his hand, something. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, he's just sleeping it off. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, anything would have been better than what they decided on. So I'm watching the opening of this film and um, I don't know, just kind of like an alarmingly violent ambush these Confederate soldiers do in the train station. I mean, it's not just a gun battle, but there's like swords drawn and our star Richard Egan as Vance Reno. You know, it was shown stabbing a guy like with a sword, like running yep. him through. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once again, this is just like soldiers battling it out or whatever. But then also they like kill the uh, station manager in cold blood, just gank him, just like yep. one right in the face. Yep. Very off brand for an Elvis movie. Yes. You know, real deaths. And what's wild is that kind of learning pretty early on, like these are our heroes. These guys who just did this. Yeah. And stole the pro- they're the protagonists. Right. And we can get into it like later as it comes up, you know, they have all this like ill gotten money. And what makes it even worse is that the war was technically over Mm -hmm. at the time, which they didn't know. There's at one point they're kind of like splitting hairs like, well, we didn't know the war was over. So technically this money that we stole is the spoils of war. So therefore we should be able to keep it. There was some kind of philosophical debate going on about the money. I don't know. Like, Uh, What's your take on all that? I would say, since technically it is after, I know that they don't know, but not knowing doesn't make it okay. So technically, they murdered people in cold blood. But the day before it would have been fine because it would have mm-hmm. been a war, and that's how war works, unfortunately. But yeah, and then they robbed it. So basically, they're train robbers just at this yeah. point. So right. anything that they've stolen, the people are going to come looking for it. And mm-hmm. either you got to cover your tracks and you try and get away with it or you turn it back in and say hey we didn't know and here it is back and maybe you get away with it that way which at one point they have the opportunity to do that but things kind of go awry and that is sure the case, so and you know not necessarily being master criminals they steal all this money and what do they do they just go home yeah they go home uh, on the way though they do for all the money they spend so from the train they picked up 12,250 bucks, which in today's money would be $223,000, a little bit over that. Okay. Which is a pretty nice haul, you know? Right. And right. now, since they were going to give it to the Confederate government, but since that didn't exist anymore, they split it up evenly between, I think there's seven of them. So they each mm-hmm. got $1,750, which comes out to almost $32,000 each. Okay. So yeah. yeah 
So the because the dollar was worth about eighteen dollars and twenty cents, twenty one cents, something like that. That's mm-hmm. how much it would be worth in today's money. Okay, eighteen sixty five. So not a bad haul, but on their way home, spending what twenty bucks of it, like right. like a suit and some provisions, and just went home, mm-hmm. and then buried everything. So right. For the way all this turns out, it's unfortunate that they didn't go on some sort of spending spree. You feel like you should at least go enjoy that money for a a little bit. Sure, sure. But yeah, just like, oh, we stole all this money. Everybody saw our faces. We're just going to go home. Right. You know, like we're not going to go on the run. We're not going to hide out or anything like that. Anyway, it's fine. Because what did they see when they get to the homestead? But Elvis Presley, plowing fields. Plowing fields. Yeah, there he is. He's in the background. The Reno brothers show up. They see their mother for the first time in, what, four or five years. Mm -hmm. Vance sees Kathy, the girl he's been pining for all these years, Mm -hmm. the first time in four or five years. And then off in the distance, there's their brother, Clint, Elvis, Mm -hmm. just behind that team of mules, just plowing a field. When they cut to him, he comes running up. Everybody's really excited. And Vance goes to pick up Kathy and... He's going to take her inside and make her get into a dress and all this stuff. And then right. he finds out some news that, well, Elvis went and married her while he was yeah. gone a couple of months beforehand. So they're all right. Up. Right. Yeah. Vance's kid brother, Clint. Yeah. Married his best girl. Well, you know, he uh, assumed uh, Vance was dead because yeah, that's, that's what, what he they were told. Right. Yeah. So right away, I was thinking if Kathy was dating Vance and that was like her taste in dudes. That if she hears that he dies, Elvis seems like a very strange second choice because you cannot get two adult male specimens on earth that that are more different than Richard Egan and Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley, 1956. Yeah. And and here's the thing. Elvis, still a good looking guy, but he's just very young. You know, he's like, he's like 20 during those 20, 21. Uh, maybe he filmed when he was 20, released when he was 21. It seems like it came out pretty hastily. I think it Mm -hmm. filmed in 56. It did. So, I mean, he would have been 21 then. So a a pretty young looking 21. Oh, undoubtedly. So 21 is super young, you know, what the hell? Even by today's standards. Yeah. Yeah. It's like back then it was really young. Right. But yeah, you're like I said, that Richard Egan, he's so rugged. He has a cleft brow. (laughs) You know, he does. He does. Um, he may make it look even more rugged. Yeah, he looks like he was carved out of granite. Yeah, pretty much. And it sounds like he smokes about three packs of Winston's a day. Yeah, he sounds like he has a device so they could put a cigarette in it so he could smoke while he sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> I think John Wayne had that. Right, right. He did. He, did. I, I, he, he swore by it. it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's what got him where he is today. <laughs> <laughs> six feet under <laughs> yeah pretty much. uh so anyway uh but suspension of disbelief with kathy it's like yeah she's on the homestead where else is she gonna go yeah she's not out clubbing right yeah. exactly i mean that's just the way things were back then yeah the way circumstances were she's on the farm who else is in that town that jethro guy right you know the i'm assuming town drunk maybe yeah maybe not yeah well he's got that kind of town drunk way about him yeah, he's like the uh, poor man's Walter Brennan, which I'm assuming nobody will know what I'm talking about. But if you look him up, Walter Brennan, that's the type they were going for. So, Well, you know, the target demographic for our listener is like 61-year-olds. So, you know, I think you probably do <laughs> all right. May, they, they may know Walter Brennan then. Yeah, yeah, yeah entirely Very popular. popular in his day. Yeah. So you got this conflict between Elvis and his older brother. You know, he married his best girl, and I am kind of surprised how well Vance Reno took it. He's just like, obviously disappointed, but just like, you know what? I'm just going to respect the fact that my kid brother is sleezing on my best girl. That's just like the way things are. Meanwhile, where did we say the money was? Buried in the barn? Yeah, they put it, they stuck it in the barn. Yeah. And I will say the only person that doesn't feel the tension between Kathy and Vance is Clint. Mm Because the mom sees that the two brothers obviously know that first dinner that they have is like so tense. And that's the other thing. So they get home, everybody gets cleaned up and they have this first dinner and literally everybody's head goes down to pray. You never see anybody break bread. It just cuts to the first Elvis song. 
like immediately. They don't explain like why they're out there. There's no like, hey, there's dad's old guitar. Are you playing that? Right. It's like right. a little bit here and there. There's no exposition of it at all. They're just like, we have seen Elvis now for almost five minutes. We have to get him singing. And that's what right. they do. Which yeah, was it's like, one of those, like, they did not have any plan for what to do with them. They knew they, well, right. they would need to introduce them and then get them singing as soon as possible. Yeah. I mean, I've seen pornos with better transitions than that. Like, oh, you know. Uh, oh, which ones? We'll talk after. We'll, I'll, I'll, right, I'll, right. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll trade notes. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's like a lead in line, like, oh, well, you know, you're not the regular cabana boy. You know, uh, or something like that, but you're right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, oh, hey, Elvis is playing probably what would have been. You tell me about the history of guitars. Did they have like the standard six string, like Spanish tuning acoustic guitar in 1860s? I would think that the. I mean, stringed instruments, of course, were like. Yeah, but I don't know if it would have been steel strings. I don't know mm-hmm. if that would have been the thing in 1865. I did not look that up, but I'm, I know Martin was making guitars of that type, but it would have been after that, that I think they were more popularized. But I think like what we consider now to be like a traditional acoustic guitar, maybe started appearing around the like 1910s, 1920s, you know, something like that. So I, I'm just calling Elvis's guitar anachronistic in something set in the 1860s. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. There were guitars back then, but I think if you wanted to make it more accurate, probably would have been playing a banjo. But how much would that have sucked? A lot. It would have sucked a lot if he was playing a banjo. I mean, the young teenage audience seeing Elvis pick up a banjo, they would have torn that theater apart. What I would like to have seen though. Okay. Let's just say for a moment, we rewrote that first scene. Mm -hmm. If he goes out and the first like four minutes of him on the porch playing music it's just him like trying to tune the banjo <laughs> and he's just like not real good at it yeah it's just like hold on i almost got it guys and the and just keeps trying and just can't get it in tune yeah but then like starts a song and it's like nope not in tune he just stops and keeps tuning it <laughs> that would have been great i'd pay yeah. great money to watch that I'd sure a lot sure. of money yeah at least yeah, yeah. 15 bucks 50 so that's 15 16 bucks yeah sounds oh, like a good time yeah, it would yeah. be hilarious. It'd be really good. And also what's very strange to me that in this movie, there are only two segments where Elvis sings, mm-hmm. but in both segments, he sings two songs in their entirety. Yeah, I know. And they're, um, I won't say bloated, but then you mm-hmm. notice like, wow, there was just a whole lot of just this happening. Right. You know, and you know, obviously on the porch, a lot of gazes between Vance and Kathy or Richard and mm-hmm. Deborah or whatever you want to call them. And then like the mother kind of like, oh man, this isn't going to be good. Right. You know? Right. But he does, he does play very long, like, oh, they're not long, they're pop songs of the time. So sure. Yeah. But I guess that's what the kids are paying to see. So they knew what they were doing. They did. But, you know, outside of uh, the song Let Me Tender, none of those other songs are like really part of the Elvis canon. You know, like nobody talks about the well, other three. Oh, I don't know, man. I really have that Poor Boy song. I've always yeah. been a fan of that one. All right. All right. I'll give you Poor but Boy. But the other but... two, I, I could leave them. Right. So the two segments where Elvis sings, he's like just on the porch after dinner, you know, just horsing around. Mm-hmm. And then what is he at? Like a county fair or... Yeah, a just bar sort of, raising. Yeah, ice cream social, some sort of reason that they would have people together to have a stage and then have Elvis play on stage again. Though you were right, it's really odd that no one ever remarks on the fact that Elvis is like playing music. Like it's, you know, young Clint Reno, he's a plow hand, whatever, you know, he's like on the homestead. You got to think when he's playing the like ice cream social, it's a gig. He's like making money off that, right? Yeah. Well, even if it's not a, a making money or on it, you would think them showing up, it's like, hey, Clint, are you going to be playing again? Or we heard you're playing some songs. But they don't address it ever at all. They never, it never make even it. comes up. It never comes up. It's just, hey, we're going to this thing. Do they even show him with the guitar when they leave? I don't think so. To go there, like they're all in the wagon. To sure, go, to sure. I don't think that it shows up at all. 
it's like there's no scene where like Richard Egan says to uh, you know his lady like, well I could see you know I could understand why you would uh, be attracted to this kid. He sings like a bird and plays guitar like a wildebeest or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Wildebeest guitar playing. Yep. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> or I don't know, like a. <laughs> no, I get like, that. Like, play, yeah. Plays guitar like a polecat or yeah, something. Yeah, he plays I guitar. Don't he plays that guitar like a banjo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I, I, I got an old joke about banjos. Uh, how, how many strings on a banjo? Oh, I know the answer to this. Okay. It's five too many. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 well. So he plays he plays that guitar like a banjo. The one thing I will say about the combo he's playing with, yeah, is that he has a guy playing drums, and I know this is suspension of disbelief, but the guy has a kick drum, and they didn't invent the pedal for the kick drum until the early 1900s. I think yeah. that was William Ludwig or whatever. I think it was 1909, and then there was another guy years later that did the double, but I think it was Ludwig that invented that so they're about 40 years too early with that drum setup yeah well you know it swings it still swings yeah yeah it's fine hey no one's looking at the drums they're looking at elvis that's right man he's just doing what elvis does right so that scene where they're at the uh the church picnic or whatever it seems to me that that reveals that elvis didn't necessarily have to marry his brother's girl because there's all these like girls like fawning over him in that scene. Yeah, and they're all like, like really young though. Yeah, I guess. Well, you know, I'm gonna say they're all about like ten to fourteen. So, but this was also the 1860s, <laughs> and it's also Elvis yeah. Presley you're talking about. So. Come on, I, you know what? I don't want to go down this <laughs> thing. You know, if it was Jerry Lee Lewis, I would be okay with you making that crack. But, Jerry Lewis, rest in peace. Absolutely, Jerry Lee yeah. Lewis. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yep. But I agree. But now when they're doing this, once again, he's playing at the ice cream social, the barn raising, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then we get a whole song, which I think is poor boy is one of them. And then that's when Vance spills the beans that he's leaving mm -hmm. uh, to cat. Right. He's like, I can't take it. I thought I could do this. I can't do it. I can't mm -hmm. see you and my brother together. So I'm leaving to go to California. And he does say something really funny to where he's like, I have an old army buddy of mine that lives out in California that has a ranch. Now they've only been there at this point, like six weeks, seven, like less than two months. So it's like the fact that like he calls him this old army buddy, like, I mm -hmm. think it would be, still be pretty fresh and he would kind of know, I mean, that guy might not even be home yet. So, right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, to get all the way to California, I mean, that could take a month or two back then. So. Was that even a state? I guess it was a territory. And surely it's established like what state this movie takes place in, right? I don't remember that. I don't remember. You where know, it. that that is really something that we should know. That's kind of embarrassing. I assumed since I'd read the stuff about the Reno brothers that they were in probably like Indiana mm -hmm. or like that kind of area, like kind of Midwestern. But I don't think that they ever say exactly. Yeah. Because I watched it twice. I never, I don't remember them ever saying like, oh, we're in this town. Right. It could just be, it's anywhere USA. Right. Well, it's apparently information you didn't need to know. And I think more proof of how hastily this was put together. Indeed. Indeed. Or like how hastily it was reassembled from what it was originally intended to be. Right. And I will say that there was another movie that was made almost at the same time. I want to mm -hmm. say it came out the year before, which mm -hmm. was a uh, rage at dawn, which came out in 1955 with Randolph Scott, mm -hmm. which was a closer telling of the tale, basically right. about the Reno brothers and more about how they were robbers and killers and this and that. And that does take place in Indiana. Well, there you go. There you go. Yeah. And it should be said that Elvis plays Clint Reno, the only real actual Reno brother in this movie. Everybody else like has been renamed from the yep. original like counterparts. So Elvis is actually playing a historical figure in this movie. Yeah. And the uh, honest one, they called him honest Clint. That was right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The only Reno brother who wasn't involved in the gang. So that's another way that this movie is off model. Like Elvis playing a historical figure. Elvis's third build, you know? Yeah. I think they say introducing, right? It says introducing Elvis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think that's his title card there. 
So once Vance and Kathy kind of have this discussion about how Vance is leaving town, some people show up looking for the money that Mm -hmm. the Reno brothers have taken. And they take them into custody and they're going to show them to the train conductor. Right. See if they recognize them. So, and I remember the guy saying, Vance saying, there's no way you can recognize us. We had beards back then. (laughs) Sure. If you look at the beginning, it's just, he had maybe like a three day beard. It's not, yeah. he had a full beard. He was just, just some scruff. Yeah. So I think I would still recognize him. Absolutely. You know, like how many so, cleft brows do you see? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody as dreamy as Richard Egan. Oh, yeah. Mm, yep. <sighs> yep. Oh, my God. Here's what might have happened if they had gotten there. That train conductor would have seen him. He just would have fainted. Yeah. <laughs> too sexy. Too sexy. Yeah, yeah. He just would have yeah, had a spell, but who knows what happens is now they're, they're in custody and a couple of the old gang show up to warn these guys that the government is out looking for their stolen money. And now is one of those guys, am I mistaken? Is that, is one of those guys, LQ Jones? I believe so. I yeah. saw him on the uh, IMDb list, and um, it looks an awful lot like him. If it's not right, but they do say he's uncredited in the film. But I, I think you are right. That's exactly the sort of thing LQ Jones would have been doing at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Once again, hitting our demographics by bringing up LQ Jones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just all these fresh references for the yeah. youngsters, man. Yeah, Walter you know. Brennan, LQ Jones, banjo yeah. jokes. I mean, we were really in them all tonight. <laughs> so, at this point, they go and they spring them from the train, mm. and kind of to the chagrin of Vance, who was like, you know, we could have just gone and given them back the money, right? And we might still be able to do that. And this sets off this whole, who's in charge now, who wants to give back the money, who doesn't want to give back the money, and this power struggle over these three guys that have shown up. One of them's uh, Mike, who's like kind of the leader of them, Mm -hmm. and the leader of the other three, and they don't want to give the money back, and the Reno brothers do. Once again, not very historical, but you know, for this telling of this tale, it's what it is. And it just gets kind of like, for me, like a little confusing. It's like all these misunderstandings, you know, like Vance is trying to find the money because he's trying to give it back. And then it's interpreted as uh, like, oh, well, he's going off to find the money to then like run off and leave the rest of us to take the heat for this. You know what I mean? Which is what the Mike character is trying to convince Clint that he's doing that Cap and Vance are taken off together. So he's trying to manipulate Clint to be on their side. Right. To be honest, it's a totally plausible theory that he has. But anyway, which is not the case at all. Like uh, Vance is trying to do the right thing, trying to give the money back. Though at no point during these negotiations, you know, they're always like, bring the money back and we'll forget this ever happened. But it's like they killed like 11 dudes. Yeah, every bit of that. Yeah, I didn't didn't do a body count, but it was plenty of people. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't kill so. anybody springing them from the train. So when they first get off the train that was taking them, when they spring the Reno brothers from the train, I think they probably could have gotten away with that at that point. But then as the body count keeps rising, I think it becomes more and more impossible for them to kind of walk this back. Yeah. When I see this movie, I think of Vance McCoy as being a fool. It's like, that's what they're telling you. They're going to do, they're going to let you go, but like, man, they're never going to let you go. They're going to get the money back. And then, you know, they're just going to like throw you in prison. Absolutely. It's unfortunate. Yeah. They're, they're probably going to spend some jail time one way or the other, because now they're war criminals and they're from the Confederacy and they were always going to make an example of these guys. Like, this is what we do. If you steal our money, even if you give it back, we're going to spend night and day hunting you down until we get our money kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And right. Price. So I don't think it's too much to just kind of skip forward. Because there's just a whole bunch of back and forth. And then Kathy goes after them and she has the money because they had to go and get the money off of the farm to give it back. But they Mm -hmm. can't go back. So they sent that Jethro character who then runs into Kathy. She goes and finds them. Vance finds her and they hide her away. Just more proof for that Mike character to Clint that there's some sort of double dealing going on, right? That these two are planning this thing. 
it all looks a little suspicious. It does. So push comes to shove. What happens is there's this little mountain campsite. Mm -hmm. So Clint and Kathy and that Mike and the other guys are up there at the campsite. That's when Vance and the two brothers show back up. And then they're trying to convince Clint, hey, we're not running off together. You know, Kathy's your wife. It's all fine, whatever. And then Clint shoots Vance. Oh, and uh, let let me point out here, uh, there was a squib when he shoots him. Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah. Which I was not expecting. Like, uh, I was expecting to be kind of like the thing where you'd see nothing or right. like you would like double over, like you got shot in the gut or whatever, but no, no. And honest to God, like a squib. So that's very off model for an Elvis movie. Could you imagine any other Elvis movie where somebody gets shot and you see like a visible bullet wound or even punched and there's blood, right? I mean, right, that, right. that's generally not what happens. I mean, it's just maybe you'll see a black eye later on somebody from something that happened, but yeah, if you punch somebody, it's just, they just fall down. It's mm-hmm. not like, oh, you bloodied somebody's lip or anything like that. So yeah, all this is really crazy stuff. But what happens is the three guys go down to get the money from Vance. And then Clint starts shooting at him to get away from Vance. And then I believe it's Mike, who's played by this guy, uh, Neville Brand. He kills Elvis. He does. So he, yeah, so he's probably the only person in moviedom to shoot and kill Elvis. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal. So then cut to funeral scene. Vance has his uh, arm all in a sling or whatnot, which I always wondered, like, you get shot in the shoulder, they put your arm in a sling. Does that make yeah, sense? I don't, I don't. Know. I don't know. I've never been shot, so I have yeah. no idea. You know. Yeah, try not to be. Try right. to avoid that's, it. That's, that's my privilege showing. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, it's just a funeral for a uh, young Clint Reno. And then you see him superimposed over the skyline singing the, uh, title theme. Yep. Cut to credits. There you go. And then Gladys starts crying. Yeah. <laughs> just yep. uncontrollably sobbing in the yep. audience. Yeah, absolutely. And then that was it. That's the whole movie. And I would say, um, if you're a kid who went to see Elvis in that movie, you got your money's worth. Probably. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I I would say so. If you went to see a faithful retelling of the Reno brothers tale, you got robbed because none of that stuff is really how it went. Basically. Because, uh, yeah, you know, I don't think this movie landed on what its original intended audience was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah, Well, it's a Western. It's supposed to be kind of a standard Western. And mm-hmm. then it kind of got morphed into an Elvis movie, but they weren't really pushing Elvis that hard, but then they did. It's the problem with this movie is it's what we've said a couple of times. It is good. And kudos to Elvis for being put in this movie that I'm going to say not a lot of great writing, not a lot of great scenes, but he found some moments where there are glimmers of pretty good acting in it. There's some few moments where he gets to moat. There's a couple of places where you're like, wow, Elvis is really acting. You yeah, know, but he's 21 years old. He's never been in a movie before. You know, it's not sure like he's a but, into pro, but you know, it's well established that Elvis was a big film fan and yeah. he was like in the movies in his head for like years up to that point. It's like, oh man, because you know, when, uh, the Colonel first signed him, that was like one of the first things that was talked about. It's like, oh, I, you know, would also like to do films. Yeah. Hey, well, um, and he delivered, he got him there. Yeah. Within what about a year or so of taking him on as a client? So. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Pretty wild. Yeah, a couple of notable things about the movie in an uncredited role. We were talking about LQ Jones when the Reno brothers they've already robbed the train. They've got mm-hmm. the money, and they're going down this road. They run into three Confederate soldiers who tell them that the war is over. One of those soldiers is played by Dick Sargent. Oh, right on. The second Darren from Bewitched. So kind of another weird uncredited role. So yeah, interesting. Well, that's just the way like people that industry worked. I mean, they're just in all kinds of crap all the time. Just yeah, churning stuff out. And I have another interesting fun fact about that scene, but I'm going to save it for a, a segment that we do called Would You Believe in a little later. So oh, okay. I'll put to put a pin in that. So. So at least I have a little bit of warning for it now. 
Um, yeah, now you know it's coming up. But anyway, the movie takes place in 1956. So it comes out, it's Elvis's first movie. But like, Wade, maybe you could maybe help us out a little bit. I know you like to go back and do a little bit of research in a segment we like to call the Wade Back Machine. So why don't you fill us in on, it's a new segment. It's new. It's a, yeah, it's yeah, it's new. We've maybe right. done it once or twice, but you've kind of done stuff like this before, but we're called, we, now it's named. But yeah, if you want to tell us a little bit about 1956, what was going on at that time? Well, as we said previously, this movie was filmed under the title, The Reno Brothers. And during filming, it would have been uh, September 9th, 1956, Elvis took a break from filming to do an appearance on the Ed Sullivan show and to debut his new single, Love Me Tender, which if you can believe it, that was the first time anyone had heard that song was on Ed Sullivan. Wow. And, you know, it was unreleased up to that point. So it created such a sensation. There was such a uh, demand for this uh, single in stores. It shipped a million copies. So it shipped platinum, which really only happened like a few times. And definitely the first time that that had happened. It debuted on the singles charts at number two. And then uh, later the following week went to number one for five weeks. And it was such a huge deal, the song, that the producers were like, we have to call this movie Love Me Tender, and we got to play up that song as much as possible. So that's kind of how it became the Love Me Tender title. So um, just, you yeah, know. And, yeah, and they went oh, back oh. and wrote more lyrics for it, right? Mm -hmm. So that scene when he's singing it over the end, they wrote extra lyrics for that part. Yeah, which is yep. weird because if you're super familiar with that song, as most of us are, hearing like a couple of like new lines in it, it's like, what the hell is this? Yeah. So yeah, that's weird. And of course, um, there were test screenings, you know, just like they do today. And the young audiences were so upset by the fact that Elvis just gets killed at the end and then it ends on his funeral and then that's it, that they had to add the uh, superimposed Elvis singing at his own funeral part mm -hmm. they had to yeah. like go back and film something that's like oh we got to do this ghost you know, elvis. To, yeah ghost elvis you know yeah. you know give him a little something if you want to talk about the charts on the charts of hit songs for november 1956 oh i'd love to i like this one uh there were such songs as if you're familiar with the platters the song my prayer okay yeah. Which, yeah. to be honest, I love that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I had to li listen to that song today and I'm like, I have not heard this song before. It's great. I think a lot of people would know the platters from like The Great Pretender. Uh, I believe that's right. Yeah. 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 That's kind of like one of their signature songs and um, the classic doo wop era balladeers. Right. Um, also on the charts was kind of a novelty song, The Green Door from Jim Lowe. If you're familiar, I, I don't know that song. I'm saying a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Which we can't play any of it on the show, but modern audiences might know this song from just a short segment in the latest Tarantino film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. There's yeah. a scene where Leonardo DiCaprio is singing a song on the old TV show Hullabaloo, and there's backup dancers. And the song that he's singing is Jim Lowe's The Green Door. Oh, okay. That's that song. Okay. That, right. All right. I know that tune that I've heard. It. Right. Yeah. And, um, also on the charts, Elvis was competing with himself because, uh, don't be cruel in November 56 was still like a big deal. Oh, he had a lot of singles out at that yeah. point. He had a lot yeah, of, but, hits but I mean, these, button. these are battling each other at the top of the charts, you know, taking turns being number one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, fall of 56 was a very good time to be Elvis. Also a song called singing the blues from someone named Guy Mitchell mm -hmm. was a big hit, Nice, which I listened to that today too. And it didn't really leave much of an impression. Just kind of like, that. <laughs> it's like that's a, what maybe know. why it's kind of forgotten. And Elvis was right. a remember. It was, it was a number one hit though. And I was like, it's fine. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, also, it was interesting. Also released on November 15th, 1956, the day that Love Me Tender came out, three other films came out that weekend. And it's all pretty uh, interesting. Uh, one film is called The Opposite Sex. And it was kind of a comedy farce about a guy who directs plays 
and his wife suspects him of having an affair with a chorus girl. So she divorces him or tries to divorce him. Later in the film discovers that it was just all rumors and the guy was not having an affair. And then the rest of the movie, she's like trying to get the guy back. It just sounds uh-huh. like some real kind of 1956 bullshit, if you ask me. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, this film stars Leslie Nielsen. Hey, there you go. And Joan Collins. Wow, there's there's a marquee for you. So it's like 1956, the stars of those movies, you could have put them in a movie in 1986, and they would have also been stars of the film. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. More, more like 88, 89. Because, you know, like after... Uh, Naked Gun came out. Leslie Nielsen was definitely established as definitely like, that guy. Yeah. Anyway, just that was interesting. Uh, also, another movie came out called Gun the Man Down. It's also a Western. The premise being a outlaw gets set up by his former gang and left for dead. And then he survives and then vows revenge on this gang. And this movie stars James Arness mm-hmm. and Angie Dickinson. And wow. I'm like... Wow, I want to see that. I kind of want to see that movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds better than Love Me Tender, if I'm being perfectly honest. Well, you know, here's the thing. I don't want to knock Love Me Tender too much. It is sure. exactly what it's supposed to be, right? And the weird thing is, in a way, I like it better than some of the formulaic Elvis movies that came later. Sure, sure. You know? I mean, if there had been at least six more movies like Love Me Tender in his filmography, that would be awesome. Just kind of like, not necessarily musicals. Maybe he sings some songs, but it's not about that. And just other shit going on, you know? Yeah, and also him being a little bit more of an ensemble, where instead of he's right. carrying it all, I don't know, whatever. I mean, we can uh, we can speculate on that as much as we want. But Sure. But, oh, uh, I saved the best for last. The final movie released on November 15th, 1956, is a movie called The Mountain. The premise being mountain climbers concoct a scheme to climb to the top of a uh, treacherous mountain to loot the corpses of plane crash victims. Wow. And uh, this movie stars uh, Spencer Tracy and Robert Wagner as the mountain climbers. Wow. That's kind of, um, it's an ingenious plan. And to tie this back in with Love Me Tender, the part of Clint Reno was originally first offered to Robert Wagner. Yeah, I've got an interesting thing about that. It was a few people uh, was offered to. I've got some. We'll get to that, though. Yeah, so. yeah, we'll get to it. Anyway, I think that's all I have for the Wade Back Machine. Also, Giant was in theaters at the time. Yeah, absolutely. The um, James Dean film released posthumously. Mm-hmm. And also right around the same time that Let Me Tinder came out, Seven Samurai came out, which I wonder if that even played in U.S. theaters probably. at the time. Well, maybe like art house theaters. Yeah. Probably yeah. not like your main. Your New main York, theater. L.A. Right? Yeah, 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 probably. So pretty interesting. So I think our takeaway from Let Me Tender is that although it was hastily written, mm-hmm. it does have a couple of good songs, a couple of songs, because I'm going to say I like Poor Boy. The other two songs are complete throwaways. And I think we start seeing glimmers of the talent that Elvis had as an actor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's unfortunately unrealized in a lot of ways, but it was there. Like you can see it in a little bit of these doing. So all in all, it's not a great movie. It seems like they're trying to fit two movies together. And these two stories are kind of competing to be the story and Either one of them would be good, but it just doesn't work out. It seems like it just, like that whole ending of it with them going back and forth and all of it just, it just seems overwrought, I guess is the word I'm looking for. I don't know. Sure. Well, I I think it's important to note for our younger listeners, when people think of Westerns, they tend to think of showdowns, you know, like shootouts in saloons and It's like, oh, it's a, you know, oil baron on the edge of town. And he's like causing trouble for the townspeople. And a lone stranger comes to save the day and all that kind of crap. There are Westerns that are definitely like that, but it's more of a setting in this film. I mean, of course, there's like Civil War stuff. And I just think that there's a lot more Westerns that are just kind of like this than there are like the traditional 
John Wayne stuff. Like, you know, I've, I've seen all the classics. I've seen Shane and The Searchers and Shaky's you know, Gun of the West. <laughs> Shaky's Gun of the West, of course. But, yeah, you but know, I think there were a lot of Westerns like this that were just kind of like just stories told with a Western tableau because I think it was super cheap to do it that way. Well, they certainly had the lots and all that stuff. And I think it right. was real cheap back then. But this one definitely feels like it was written in a boardroom. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, what's going to make money? We got to get this kid in here. Okay. So we do this. He needs a love interest. Let's uh, have him and the older brother. They're going to fight over the girl. And then uh, one of the one of, I don't I guess, kill Elvis at the end of it. And then we'll play this song. We need an X amount of songs for it. You know, get somebody out writing these songs. And then it's like, okay, write the script. This is what it has to be. That's what they did. And that's what it feels like they did. But all in all, it got him where he needed to be. It was a springboard for a lot of success he had in Hollywood. So I would check it out. I would say check it out for sure. Well, if you're an Elvis fan and you've listened this far, I think it's a very safe bet you've seen this movie already. But if you haven't and you're kind of on the fence about it, definitely worth a watch for no other reason than to gaze upon that dreamy Richard Egan. Yeah, absolutely. And once again, if, if you just want to skip to where Elvis shows up, I think he shows up about 18 and a half minutes in. You mm -hmm. just skip to there, then you're just going to see him in the background, like plowing a field behind two mules, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of coming off the audience right and going to the left of doing that. So that's his big screen debut. So, yeah. well, I think this leads us to your favorite part of the show. Okay. Well, you know, you gave me a warning this time. So I'm I did. I mentally, did. I did give yeah. So I think we're going to maybe get into your favorite segment and nobody else's, which is mm. Would You Believe? And this week we got a new sponsor for Would You Believe? And wait, why don't you tell us about our new sponsor? Our new sponsor tonight is Steve's Cheese. Always have a treat up your sleeve with Steve's Cheese. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, absolutely. Good. They've got uh, all the all the cheeses, right? Looking for cheddar? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you right now, Steve's is better. Oh, yeah? Do you like Swiss? Mm -hmm. Steve's has a gray air you don't want to miss. Our Gouda is good enough for your mother. <laughs> That's Steve's cheese. Always have a treat up your sleeve with Steve's cheese. You know, I'm going to tell you, I'm a big fan of their uh, Bronx Cheer Blue. <laughs> <laughs> we should be able to do this without laughing. We should, but you know what? <laughs> right, that, yeah, those, you know that's what? Steve's cheese. Thank you so much. Well, 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 well. So let's start off with Would You Believe? So I told you about that scene where there's the three soldiers on the road and they mm -hmm. tell the Reno brothers, war is over, ain't you heard? And this was nuts. So I read this. When Elvis got this movie, he called back to Memphis and he got Scotty, Bill and DJ. And he's like, Hey, you guys got to come out here mm -hmm. because we can get you on set. We can get you paid to be in this movie as extras. And originally what they tried to do was get them to be those three characters. And he tested them. And literally they said to him, to these three, you're not hillbilly enough. But apparently yeah. Dick Sargent was, Interesting. would you believe, would you believe? Oh, I'm the worst at these and so gullible. So I'm going to say, I do believe that. Nah, I made that up, but God damn it. that was pretty good. That was weird. Another, would you believe we had talked about people that the role of Clint Reno was offered to, mm -hmm. and one of the guys that was on the short list and had done a screen test for it was none other than Richard Crenna. Ooh. Yeah. Ah, uh, I'm going to say, no, I don't believe that. Yeah, you're right. I made that up too. God damn it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, would you believe I did talk about this, uh, this guy, the guy that plays Mike Gavin, the guy who's the leader of the three guys trying to convince Clint that Vance is against him. So mm -hmm. that guy was the first guy to ever play Butch Cassidy on screen. And the guy that played the Sundance kid with him. With mm -hmm. Alan Hale Jr., the skipper from Gilligan's Island. <laughs> Would you believe? I'm going to say yes, I do believe that. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. That's true. He was the That's wild. Yeah, right? Yep. Yeah, pretty crazy. Oh, I've got a couple for you tonight. 
Are, are okay. you done? Do you need to do more? I have a couple more, but why don't you take a few, then we'll get back to mine. Because, you know, we might have the same uh, trivia that we're okay. trying to... Okay, uh, you got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Richard Egan, when the show The Twilight Zone was originally being developed, Rod Serling wanted Richard Egan to be the host of the show. And whatever contract dispute made it not happen, so Rod Serling is, okay, I will host my own show. Because he was my only choice, and I don't want to pick anyone else. And I, what I hear, I heard was that Richard Egan went and didn't want to do it because cut into his cigarette smoking time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I would believe that. I would believe that. Yes, yes, that okay. is uh, awesome. That, that's awesome. absolutely true. Yeah. All right, you got another one. You got another one for me, or no? I do. I do. It's uh, also more uh, Richard Egan casting trivia. Oh, I like this. Two years before Let Me Tender came out. There was a proposed TV series that was going to be based on Prince Namor, the Submariner, the timely comic superhero. Okay. And Richard Egan was cast as Prince Namor, the Submariner, in a uh, TV show that never happened. Oh, I, I, I think it's made up. That is actually true. That's true. Oh, wow. Yes, I could see him. Yes. I could see that. I see the face and all that. Yeah. And just, this is, there's no okay. verification of this, but the year after the plans for the uh, Prince Damore Submariner show were scuttled, Richard Egan starred in a movie called Underwater, where he played like a deep sea diver. Okay. And a lot of people think like, oh, well, the prep that he was putting into that, he just like ended up using for uh, that film. Wow. I believe that. I wonder if they would have shot that dry for wet. What do you think? Almost undoubtedly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're not going to put actors in tanks back then. No yeah. way. And, you know, here's like something that I found like really weird about it. It's like, I think the whole idea was DC had a hit series with Adventures of Superman with uh, mm -hmm. George Reeves. And Timely Comics was like, well, we got to get into this game too. Who do we got in our roster? And I'm like, why wouldn't you go with like Captain America? Yeah, something. Yeah, it's really like, odd. It's, like, and here's the thing. That guy, Richard Egan, mm. he would have been a great Captain America. Sure. Uh, maybe a little, uh, I don't Big know. Too, too long in the tooth, a little too old? No, no, not not old, but just, I don't know, a little swarthy for Captain Pet America. Oh, okay. All right. Um, but, I mean, it's like, make a Captain America movie. I mean, he lives on land and, like, walks down the street and goes into buildings and stuff. It's like... The Submariner, it's like, he spends most they're of the like, time underwater. Like, they're like talking doing? to fish and stuff. Right, right. Yeah. And, like, and then all the seafood budget on that would have been insane. <laughs> it would have been. It's like yeah. lobster again. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. That's what sunk that show. But like undersea Welcome. kingdoms and, you know, like, what are you guys thinking about? Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So uh, do, you have, do you have any more for us? Uh, I got a couple. All right. So uh, would you believe that the song... Love Me Tender is actually a Civil War ballad that they rewrote the lyrics to called R.A. Lee. Uh, I would believe that. Yeah, that's yes. true. That is true. Yeah. That was a, it was a hit, too. Like, other people before that had hits with it. So, mm -hmm. so would you believe that just before the filming started for Love Me Tender, in Memphis, Elvis and Red, the go to the fair, like the state fair, in Memphis, mm -hmm. and Red gets into a fist fight at the fair, and then Vernon Presley's like, "Well, I don't think Red's gonna go out to L.A. with us. Like he can't go." So he basically says, "Screw you, you can't go." So Red got mad, and he went and joined the Marines. Would you believe mm. that's the reason he went and joined the Marines? Uh, I believe it. It's true. Yeah, that's true. Wow, it, you know, and it's just. Like red is always like getting into fist fights in places. Like what's, what's going on there? That is his MO, especially at that age. He was like, he liked fighting. Yeah. That, that's how he, he settled disputes with his fist for sure. What do you think the deal was? Cause he was kind of funny looking and like had a shock of red hair. Do you think people were like teasing him about it and he got into fights about it? I or? think he just had a short temper, man. I think he had a short temper. Didn't take any guff. I don't know. I think that's part of it. Okay, I've got a couple of quick ones for you. I'll sure. rapid fire these. Would you believe this one I thought was pretty funny? That this is according to the Selvis Day by Day, that the two mules that 
Elvis used as his plow horse, or, you know, the plow horses or whatever, that at the rap party, Colonel Tom Parker had bought them and gave them to Elvis as a gift. Would you believe? Um, I'm going to say no. I don't believe that. I made that up. Yeah. 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 One last one, which is while they were doing correspondence about getting Elvis out to LA, it was Colonel Tom and Tom Diskin, I think is the name of the guy. (laughs) Uh, but when they would write correspondence back and forth with each other, they would refer to Elvis as the cat. Um, yes, yes. I, I, I would believe that. And that is true. It is absolutely true. Oh. I'd have to go back and look at these, but I think you got quite a few of them this time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think yeah. this is the most would you believes we've ever done in one time. Yeah, there were just a bunch of them. So yeah, yeah, there you go. So that's it. That's all the would you believes. I, I just still have a couple of questions for you. Okay, go on. What are they? Something I was left with at the end of this film. So um, Mike kills Clint. Correct. And they, ba- and they bury him in the backyard. Yeah. And then they like walk back to the homestead to an uncertain future. How soon do you think Vance say to Kathy, like, look, Clint is dead. So like, what are we doing here? Let's go bang it out. I would say. Do you think they say that on the way back to the house? Well, I think they're both thinking it. Yeah. Right. Now, what they're going to do is go through a period of mourning, which is going to be about two to three days. Sure. Or like, I'm going to say one like lunar cycle. And then that's like, generally, if somebody's going to come back from the dead, right? That's like how long it takes. That I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, right. It's like an Aztec thing. I don't know. But then if that, if they've made it that long, then it's just, I think they're just going to both be out on the horseback and find a nice little place. And then they're going to go swimming and then Mm -hmm. things are just going to happen. And they're going to have a little kid and they're going to name him Clint. So what if they decided to wait as long as Kathy waited before she buried Clint when she heard that Vance was dead? So it was like three and a half years or so, almost four years. Yeah. You know, I I could see Vance doing that just so he's, you know, no one would think he was a scumbag or whatever. Uh, No, I don't think, I don't think anybody's going to care. I mean, the guy's like, obviously Clint was just in his way. So like that Mike guy did him a solid. It was. It was, yeah. So I'm sorry to say, kind of a happy ending in that the only thing sort that of. was keeping Vance and Kathy apart was this little Clint son of a bitch who, uh, kind of a squirrely kid, really. Yeah. Despite being able to like sing a good tune and dance right. pretty well and, you know, right. cite the young girls in town, you know, sure. what else would he have really going on? I mean, the house was in just incredible disrepair when they got there. Yeah, I mean, Gamma, you know, step up your game, Clint. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, yeah it's too bad. Um, one more question for you. Okay, go on. Lay it on. And this is kind of a throwback to uh, episode one, where I talked about that weird dream that I had that the members of KISS starred in just as many movies that Elvis had done. Mm-hmm. The role of Clint Reno in Let Me Tender what member of KISS would have been the most appropriate to make his screen debut as that character? So as Clint. And so are the other members of KISS playing the other brothers? Uh, I mean, come on. I think that'd be great. That would be, just for the sake of this argument, which member of KISS is the Clint Reno? It's uh, Peter Chris. Yeah. If he's yeah. in makeup, if he's in makeup, if he's not in makeup, well, yeah, that, Paul, that, then, it, then it's Paul Stanley. Uh, well, it, it would be in makeup. It would be like a full like Catman character. Oh yeah, that I'm going. Uh, I'm going Peter Chris because it's certainly not Gene Simmons. It's not Gene Simmons. It's not Ace. So you got to go Paul or Peter Chris. But I think Paul would have a better, like a different role. Yeah, and just imagine like, well, I guess the only songs to him just doing Beth on the mm-hmm. porch. But singing it to, or he was just like, but he changed the name to Kathy. Right. And then there's like the longing. So I guess Richard Egan is still playing that part. <laughs> right. Right. But like uh, 20 years later. Sure. Which I'm sure like, he still could have But it's like, some, like Odyssey. It's some weird like Ulysses, Odysseus. Like it takes him like 20 years to get home kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I think they would have renamed Kathy as Beth. And the movie Smart. would have been, the movie would have been called Beth. Sure. Yeah. Or they would have just called it, I hear you calling. Yeah. 
There you go. Uh, all right. You or heard that's the song. Calling. There you go. There it is. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we got it. I think we did about all we can do with it. So yeah, Peter Chris would definitely play that. And uh, kudos to you for bringing up Kiss. Yeah. I, I just think it should be a regular part of the show. Well, yeah. We should have a Kiss Corner. Ooh, Corner with a K. I do. I do mean corner with the K. So kiss sure. corner with the K. So absolutely. So I think, well, you know, I think there's nothing left to do, but uh, wrap the show up a little bit here, put a little bow on it. Well, this was a good one tonight. Uh, I had a lot of fun talking about love me tender. Uh, uh, as did I. It's good to just go back and watch a piece of Elvis media that you're not just like super sick of watching that you've like seen a million times. I agree with that. And also I know like you know, kind of post having seen the biopic that came out and I know that they're doing one that I think is based on another thing that's based on Elvis and me filming right now. Mm-hmm. So that will be something we'll probably watch in the future, but it's nice to go back and see sort of like the Genesis stuff, the mm-hmm. early Elvis. And I know we had talked about maybe doing early albums or something like that, but I think that first movie It's kind of a nice place to kind of go. So yeah, it was Mm -hmm. fun. It was definitely fun to watch it and go back and see it for the first time in years. Like I said, I haven't watched in a long time. So, Mm -hmm. and, uh, if you've not seen love me tender, the way that I watched it was it's on YouTube in its entirety, like a real high def version. It's awesome. I hope this isn't contribute to it getting taken down for copyright violations, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think the people on YouTube are listening to this and they're like, oh Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Where are they watching those movies at? We got to take them down. So. Right. Right. Yeah. We're going to get, you know, uh, 85 minutes into a podcast about Elvis looking for clues. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I think that's it. Do you want to get in touch with us? Feel free to send us an email at suspicious minds podcast. 77 at gmail or you can if you're not in that maybe you can send us a text or a voicemail at uh 773-389-4276 and uh, where else can they reach us oh you can find us all over the uh popular social media platforms if you do instagram we are called suspicious minds podcast just one word Look for us on Instagram. You can also find us on Facebook. We are at Suspicious Minds Podcast with Wade and Burl. We're the only ones called that on Facebook. Should be pretty easy to find. All right. And what I think is we should, since everybody likes the jumpsuit photos so much, we should just do a show about jumpsuits. Oh, we really need to. Like a jumpsuit bracket. Yeah. Uh, Where it's like we kind of talk about certain jumpsuits. I mean, we don't want to give too much away. But yeah, we'll figure it out. But then let's just say forthcoming, stay tuned. We're going to do a show about jumpsuits. We obviously have not figured out how it's going to be, but we're going to do it. But um, yeah, I think that's where I think we're pretty much kind of wrapped up. Do you think LQ Jones would be in the Kiss version of Love Me Tender? I bet he would. Uh, yeah. I mean, he still would have been around in the uh, yeah, like the seventies era. Yeah, with like the mustache and the white hair and Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I guess that's it. I guess until next time, I have been Burl. And I am Wade. And we'll talk to you next time. So thanks for listening. Thank you. Good night.